Uh, today, uh, we're going to present you to the newest family member of Mystica Technology. This session will be divided into three different parts. First, our managing director, Jeff Mills, will give you a brief introduction to the product. Uh, and then we'll jump directly to Mystica Workflows presentation that is going to be carried out by our CEO, Miguel Angel Doncel, and our Mystica expert, Adrian Gonzalez. Uh, all right, off to you, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Eva. So, hello, and many thanks for joining us during this very challenging time. We really appreciate you are joining on this special day for SGO and know that many of you are working from home, just like all the SGO team. So, hopefully, we won't have any technical issues while we're doing the presentation today. So, today, SGO is delighted to formally release Mystica Workflows, a product with an engineering heart and an artistic soul, but importantly, with simplicity at its core. Mystica Workflows is built on Mystica technology, so it's constantly evolving, being powerful, flexible, and achieves the highest quality result by embracing the latest industry camera codecs and file formats. In fact, it is Mystica Ultima under the hood with just a different skin. It can do complex things easier, faster, and smarter, from transcoding to packaging and final delivery. It's also designed to significantly reduce errors and saves time so that you can focus on the creativity. It is fully compatible with all Mystica technology-based products, such as Mystica Boutique, Mystica Ultima, and Mystica VR, and we're gonna show you more of that later in the presentation. So it's a solution for everyone, whether you're a broadcaster, a VFX house, a post facility, actually anyone who needs to manage media, Mystica Workflows is the perfect tool for them. And it also has a very low cost of entry and a subscription model from just 49 euros a month. And also no expensive ongoing support costs. And if you really want Mystica workflows to be tailored specifically for your needs, we have the option to, for SDO to offer bespoke development services. So Mystica workflows, we feel really is an industry game changer. So the best thing actually is probably for us to take a look I'm going to hand you over to Miguel, who's going to give you an overview of the interface and how it basically works. Over to you, Miguel. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for the introduction, Jeff. And let me share my screen so we can jump into the product. You should see my screen now, I hope. Okay. And Mystica Workflows is... Uh, this window here is, I will do a small introduction as Jeff uh, said to explain a little bit of the user interface and uh, how to use it. So this area here is the place where we will build our workflows. Mystica Workflows is a tool that will allow you to automate any kind of workflows and will help you to build and run automatically on your footage anything you, you may want. So in this area here, I will build the workflows that I want. This section here, the finder, is the section where I can select any of the available nodes into the system. So they, they are divided in three sections, input, tasks, and outputs. And uh, I have also the ability to use names to filter out specific things. For example, if I want to use an array file, I could use the finder to filter out my array file and find it. And I'm going, for example, get this node and drop it here. So this will be an array file. When I select it, you will see here in the help viewer that I will see uh, an online version of the documentation for this node. This uh, online help will explain me the properties and how to use each specific node. Obviously, the different nodes have different helps. I am not going to use the help viewer during this presentation because I prefer to have more space for my properties. So I'm going to make the properties section bigger. And the properties section are actually the parameters that you will use on every single node. So for example, in this case, if I have an array file, I, I can get access of the what color space I will use, if I want to change the ISO or I want to change the Kelvin temperature of the tint or any parameter. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open um, one folder where I have some array footage and I'm going to get this sequence and drop it into my file, into my array file to have some actual media associated with this node. And when I see it, you will see that this media has Rec 709 by default as a color space and TCI P3 uh, gamut uh, space. And uh, 
I also have access to all the metadata into the file. So here I have access to all the different uh, information available into the ARRI file. Not only resolution and clip name, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also I also have access to information like, for example, the um, lens information uh, that was used during the during the shooting, or the VFX information with the GPS location during the shooting, the pan tilt and roll information, the audio information on the shot. So you you have access to all the different blocks of information that ARRI offers you into the RSDK. That happens with all the raw format. It happens similarly with uh, RED files or with Sony uh, raw format, etc., etc., etc. So let's suppose I want to build uh, something very, very simple. I want to get this uh, ARRI file and I want to generate an H.265 sec um, version. So I can get my NVIDIA GPU accelerated H.265 node. I can put it here and I can connect both of them. And uh, here, if I select the NVIDIA H.265, H.265, you will see that I have access to different properties because obviously here is, this is a transcoder, so I have different parameters. And um, that is pretty much the user interface, uh, Jeff. That is the basics that people will need to understand in order to follow this presentation. Yeah, thanks, Miguel. That was really great. But of course, we know mystical workflows can do a lot more. So do you want to show us something that almost everyone would want to do? Yeah, sure. But we can, for example, based on this workflow that we currently have, uh, we could try to make it more useful. Let's suppose that I am working in a workflow where I want to have um, a specific uh, watch folder, a specific directory where my artist, Adrian, whenever he places something, the system will automatically generate a low resolution version of that content, for example, an H.265, in order to upload it to Vimeo and send an email to the customer. So the, um, uh, if I want to do that, well, this could be the beginning of the workflow. I could get uh, my file. I could uh, transcode it to H.265. But because I am going to send, in, to send this information outside, I may want to do a couple of uh, tweaks to the, to the content. For example, I may want to overwrite the time code into the um, into the material. So whenever I am talking with the customer, I, we have a time reference into it. And I may want also to add a watermark, in this case with our logo, just for security reason. I don't want to deliver the content outside because we are going to upload it to Vimeo. I don't want to do it without a, a watermark. So I can activate these two things. Next thing to do would be to add a Vimeo node. So if I get the Vimeo node and I put it here, I can just link them. And when I link it, the our login window will pop to allow me to log in our Vimeo account. So I am going to use our own Vimeo account for this. Okay. So I log in my account and I allow my application to access uh, the Vimeo content. And that's it, it's ready. Now this, um, this node is ready. The last thing to do would be to send the notification email that we, that we did mention. So what I am going to do for that is I am going to add an email node and connect it here. And uh, for example, uh, well, into the, um, okay. In, uh, for example, in order to show the test, Jeff, I will use uh, your email address in order to send the, um, the email, so you will receive the notification. Another thing that I may want to do also is because uh, this is a test and we don't want to really make public into our Vimeo channel this content, I, I am going to change the amount of people that can have access to, to this uh, content and limit it only to people with the link. So I will, whenever it is published, it will not be public to everybody. It will only be available for you because you, you will have the link. Okay. And uh, this will be the, the workflow, but in order to make it really useful, I don't really want to process this sequence. I want to process anything uh, coming from a watch folder. So what I am going to do is to add a watcher here. 
and this node represents a folder. A folder in my system where I will be listening and anything landing into that folder will be sent through the workflow. It will be transcoded to H265, uploaded to Vimeo, and the email notification will be, will be sent. So I'm going to connect the watch folder here, and the next thing I'm going to do is we have here a shared folder uh, that I am sharing with Adrian. Uh, is uh, This folder is in Google Drive, so we are sharing this same folder. And Adrian, I'm going to listen from the media folder, so anything mm -hmm. that you put into this folder will be s sent through this workflow. I just drop it here, and there it is. If I open the media folder, you will see that it is empty at this point. Uh, when Adrian saves something into that folder, it will be start it will start a workflow and it will be processed so in order to activate this the last thing to do is to activate the, the workflow now this workflow is active so adrian i pass you the work uh, the yeah. word and you can show us how to how this continues okay all right let me stop sharing my folder okay all yours. so okay there we go so now I'm sharing my, my screen in here. All right, so uh, let's say that we have an edit, in, uh, an edit here of my, of my commercial version. For example, this is my 20 seconds uh, commercial version. I have some grades over my shots and some transition, just uh, basic stuff. And the idea is instead of, um, of making all the versions and all the media management from here for the delivery, in boutique, which at the, at the end is a, is a waste of time, of my time and, and Mystica's time as well in, the, in this case, uh, I prefer to use Mystica Workflow to make automatic the whole process. In this particular case, I'm using uh, Mystica Boutique as an, as, not, an, as an agnostic example of a finishing system or editing system or compositing system, okay? Mystica Workflows can work perfectly well in any workflow with any other solutions out there. Uh, if I have Mystica Boutique or Mystica Ultima, I can just uh, send this, uh, this edit, this project as metadata directly to Mystica Workflow. So in that case, I don't need to make any render in Mystica Boutique, which is much more efficient. But in this case, again, because we are using this as an agnostic example, I will make a master render in here in Boutique, and I will uh, put that master render in the shared folder that I have with Miguel to start the process and make the, the rest of the of the actions of the tasks in Mystic Workflow. So first thing I'm going to do is to select the part I want to render, which is this one. Then I'm going to the, my output panel. Uh, here I'm going to select uh, QuickTime and uh, Progress. I will select, I'm going to select now a Progress Proxy just to go uh, faster during this presentation. But of course, uh, if you are making a master render of your project, you you obviously will select a, a, a highest quality version of progress like a 444 or maybe an EXR. I don't know. That's up to you guys. So in this case, I will select a progress proxy and I'm going to select as well the folder where I'm going to put that uh, clip, which is uh, in shared lot media, which is the folder that we have uh, shared. Okay, there we go. And I'm going to call it a master clip. And then I'm going to make a render. So this will start the render. It will take only a few seconds. And well, because we are using Google Drive, uh, it will take a few seconds to communicate with, uh, with uh, Miguel's search folder there and to upload the file. So the process will start now in, in just a few seconds. So let's come back to work with Miguel. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Let me share my folder again then. And. Uh... Here we are. So uh, let me open for you again the share uh, the share folder so you can you can see it. Uh, okay. At any point, the the document should land and the system will start. Here it is. Uh, the system start to transcode the to H two six five. It is transcoding at this point. Whenever the transcode is done, it will start uploading to uh, uploading it to Vimeo. It may take a few seconds because it's, uh, it's a few... How long is the clip, Adrian? It's 20 seconds? Uh, about right? 20 seconds. 30 yeah. seconds, so it may need a little bit of time. It's done. And now the notification email is being sent to Jeff. So now we should have the clip in... You should have one email, Jeff, in your uh, folder. Mm -hmm. And that, that mail should probably have the default text, which is put your text here. I didn't write something. By the way, I can put here... 
whatever I want in order to send the email, obviously, and the link to the um, to the clip. So probably it's a good time if I stop sharing and we see we, we go to you, Jeff, to see if you did receive it. Okay, let me just uh, share my screen on the email. So there we go. I've got the email uh, in there actually. So uh, I can click on that one. And hopefully the clip will be there. Here it is. Okay. Yeah, of course. So I'm playing the clip and there's the time code and there's the and watermark in the bottom right hand corner. Absolutely perfect. Very nice. Okay. So, um, I mean, that actually looked really easy. I think actually I could probably do that, Miguel, to be quite honest. But anyway, um, best leave it to, to you guys. But uh, how about creating something more complex, um, a more complex workflow that perhaps a, a, a typical post facility or VFX house would want to design and deploy as part of their pipeline? Yeah, well, uh, indeed, we can. This was a very simple example. Let me share again my screen, and we could probably evolve this example to something more complex. So let me zoom out a little bit and rearrange these nodes a little bit in a linear way. So let's suppose this is. I am um, working on a bigger project, and uh, I want to organize the material I am going to send to the different departments or different par uh, partners in order to to have an input point for footage coming from other vendors and spreading that footage to the editorial people, to the VFX people, and et cetera, et cetera. So one thing I could do in general, whenever you are working in a big project, you may have probably defined a color space, a specific color space in order to exchange material with other people. So let's, uh, so far we didn't mention any color space that we are using. So let's suppose that uh, in my case, I want to add here, between the watch folder and the uh, NVIDIA clip, let's suppose I want to add a, a set color space node. This node will allow me to indicate to the system what kind of color space the, in, the input uh, material is using, despite of the fact that the, that color space could be defined in the metadata or not. So if, even if it is, for example, a DP, DPX sequences or something, if I know that it is coming in a specific color space, I can define it here. So let's suppose that uh, we want to do uh, use ACCC and uh, uh, AP0 as the gamut for all the, col uh, the color space incoming because we agreed with uh, the rest of the departments or companies to use that as the standard. So if I do that, when I send you the H265 uh, version to Vimeo, I obviously don't want to send it in ACCC. So I may want to, at the same time that I am doing the transcoding, I want to, to change the color space. And for that we have unicolor technology, Mystica unicolor technology integrated into the system. So I can change the color space I want to use and I could use, for example, Rec 709. So in this case, I'm going to use Rec 709 for you. And I am going to use, to put this note here for the, the beginning of the, of the workflow. But uh, let's suppose that next thing I want to, to do is I may want to do a, a backup. So anything coming, I want to copy it to a, or maybe I want to copy it to a real to a real time storage, or I want to do just a backup for security. This could be especially handy if I am on set, for example. I may want to copy whatever footage is coming to a safe place to have a redundant copy of the material. So I could get this node and copy here. And the copy node is orange, which is the status of the node. You will see that most of the nodes we are using, they are green. It means they are ready to be processed. In this case, it is orange. And the reason for that is the destination is not, is not cannot be empty. If I am copy the footage, I need to specify where I want to copy the, um, the footage. So let me open... Uh, let me open uh, here in the directories. I have... Um, the local storage, and I have a backups directory here. I'm going to use this uh, folder, this backup folder to copy all the incoming content. So now I have my incoming material, I have my security version, and let me 
generate, for example, for you three different versions of this content. Let me generate, uh, for example, a ProRes version for the editorials because they are using Avid and they may want me to send them a ProRes uh, clip. And uh, so I could get a ProRes transcoder. And in this case, because this could be, for example, a um, high dynamic range pro uh, project, I may want to use uh, as a color space uh, Rec 2020. So I'm going to generate Rec 2020 color space progress files. And let's suppose I am going to use um, Aspera, for example, in order to send this content to the editorial people. So I could add an Aspera client here. Oops, oh, sorry, this one. Okay. And send the progress using Aspera to whatever Aspera server, server I want to use. And I could, for example, use Slack. Uh, imagine that I have an Slack channel in the company to send notifications. I could have a webhook, a Slack, a, a webhook from Slack in order to send a notification every time a new clip has been sent to Aspera. So I could tell them, hi guys, here you have a new clip for you or whatever you want, you could write that here. Hi guys, here you have a new clip. And uh, this will put, I we will speak about that later, this will put the list of input uh, clips into the into the node, which by definition is normally what I want to do. And uh, let's suppose I want also to generate an EXR sequences, and I want to use the EXR sequences for the VFX people. So for example, I could get the input uh, contents, go to the EXR sequence, and let's suppose I want to use for them, I want to use the linear color space because if they are going to use to do VFX, probably they want me to send them the contents in linear color space. And let's suppose the way I want to use to send them the content is using an FTP node. So I could get an FTP node, put it here. And again, as we said before, we could add a notification, for example, with an email or we could uh, use another Slack channel in order to do the notification, whatever we want. You, we can use a notification to these people in whatever way we think uh, is the best. Um, for example, uh, the last thing to do is from the material I am sending to VFX, I want to send a, a specific copy for review to the DOP, for example. So I could generate an H.264 version of this uh, content and get that H.264 H2 version and upload it to Frame.io. So I can put a Frame.io node here and put it there. I connect it. And if I go to the Frame.io uh, node, it has my credentials in order to access to Frame.io and I could define the team I want to use into the Frame.io web portal, the project we want to use, and for and the directory where I want to store the content, for, for example, in pre-production uh, directory. And uh, so this whole workflow, I will make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. This whole, whole workflow, if I activate it, which is active at the moment, if any sequence or uh, movie lands into this uh, watch folder, it will be assigned a color space, it will be a backup will be made, it, it will be three versions will be generated, one in H265 to send you using Vimeo, one in ProRes to send to the editorial department using Aspera, and one EXR sequence to send using FTP uh, to the um, to the to the VFX people and the H.264 uh, to be uploaded to Frame IO. But even more, for example, if here in between I want to add um, a checksum information to make sure because I am using FTP, I want to send you an MD5 file to allow the people receiving the material to validate the consistency of the information. I could say, for example, add a checksum here. And instead of going from here to there, go from here to here and here to here. And now I could have a checksum. And I could be keep adding more and more nodes, more and more functionality. The beauty of this is 
as it is active, I don't have really to do anything else. Once it's ready, I leave it running, and anything landing here will go through the workflows. All the versions, all the notifications will be sent every time something lands into the watch folder, Jeff. Mm, I mean, that's really great, uh, Miguel, and I can see how that would be useful for so many facilities, and, and also the fact that we're you know using to our best advantage to the Mystica, um, you know, color science there with those color transforms. And also that official Apple ProRes support is, is really fantastic. I love that. Um, but of course, Mystica Workflows is built on Mystica technology, as I mentioned before, and there so therefore works seamlessly uh, with the other Mystica technology products. So about how about showing us something that utilizes this very fact and is so very unique to Mystica Workflows? Uh, yeah, sure. I, we can do that easily. Um, let's figure out, uh, let's suppose another example. Let's suppose we are working on, um, on a new project where we are expecting to receive footage coming from the customer. We know the footage is coming from an old movie, for example, and we know that before doing the actual production, we will need to apply quite a lot of restoration to clean up the material. So let's suppose that we want to build a workflow in which instead of getting all the information coming and giving it to Adrian, our artist, in order to start working, we want to save his time. And we want to use that income, that ingest part of the workflow to apply a set of uh, VFX into the content to clean up automatically all the content. So when Adrian goes to the content and start doing his job, actually all the cleanup has been done automatically as part of the in just a workflow. So in order to do that, we could create a watch folder and on any material landing into that uh, folder, we can apply a VFX stack. So Adrian, probably the easiest way for this is if you can build sure. a stack that I can apply, you, we can, you, we just, uh, I will just apply your stack on every conversion and I will generate the clip for you. Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Let me share stopping my, my sharing my screen and let's go to yours then. All right. Okay, so now I'm sharing my screen again. I'm going to hide this part of my timeline to not get distracted and just show one clip that we will use as a reference for this final this part of the presentation. So as we said uh, before, uh, one obvious part of the integration between Mystica Boutique and Ultima and Mystica Workflows is the fact that you can send uh, renders from Mystica Boutique or Ultima with a metadata file and just make the rendering Mystica Workflows. But th that is kind of obvious. Uh, but we can go farther than that. And for that, we can use this, uh, our whole color tools, uh, our whole FX tool setting here uh, to try to make some adjustments in our images and do those adjustments in batch in, in, in Mystica Workflows. Because at the end, for example, in this in this particular case, we want to make a restoration process of our media, and Mystica Boutique at the end is a creative tool set. We have uh, quite a lot of uh, tools for any kind of uh, project, any kind of process, but at the end, I'm a creative operator, so it's a bit of it's a waste of time for me, like trying to restore and clean all my shots one by one and make the render in Mystica Boutique. It will take uh, quite a lot of time, depending on the amount of shots that I have. So. At the end, it's much more efficient to use Mystia Workflow for that. That it's going to apply this kind of uh, adjustment automatically on top of my shots. So again, I can use all those effects, and not only these effects, but as well uh, external uh, plugins. In this case, the DBO, the Digital Vision uh, plugins, to try to make this process of restoration of my shots. So for that, I'm going to use this shot that you can see it has a dead pixel over there as an example of what we can do with. Uh, with my media. So first thing I'm gonna do is to go to my FX panel and I'm going to apply the DBO pixel effect on top of it. This will remove all the dead pixels in, in, in my shots uh, automatically. I don't need to make any, any change in the default parameters. Uh, in, in this case, it works just automatically by just applying the effect, okay? But we can apply any change in here and we can just save uh, all these uh, all these adjustments and as a part of my stack of my display viewer. Now I'm going to combine this external plugin with an internal uh, tool in Mystia, which is the debanding. This is a very powerful and smart uh, debanding tool that we have. Uh, that it, it works especially well uh, in high uh, resolution in, in in high quality projects, for example HDR projects 
where you get uh, banding in some, extreme, in some extreme situations. So this banding will work uh, quite well to remove those uh, those situations. It, it doesn't affect the quality of the image. It just it, it can only improve it. So I will leave it in that way. I won't I won't touch the, the default values of my effects in here as well. But in the final one, in the DBO quality, this is a denoise by digital vision. So I'm going to apply this denoise. We can use an external denoise by digital vision, or you can use our internal. As you can see, I can build my stack in the way that I want. I can combine external plugins or internal tools uh, with all the flex with all Mystica flexibility. So it's that's absolutely you. In this particular case, just to show that, uh, well, I, I, we can just change any parameter here. I'm going to change the aggressiveness to from from uh, uh, 0.5 to 0 0.8 or well, whatever we want. Again, we can combine these effects and change the parameter in the way that we want. So once I have a stack that I know it works and that I can apply to the rest of my shots, what I'm going to do is to create a preset based on these three effects and this stack. Uh, this is what we call display filter. So I'm going to open my display filter panel and I'm going to click in create display filter. In here, I'm going to call it uh, cleanup and I'm going to save it. Okay. This creates automatically a metadata file. This file can be sent by email or with a shared folder, uh, it's very light, it's just pure metadata that I can just send directly uh, to Miguel to integrate it with Mystica Workflow so he can apply it in all the shots that lands in the watch folder. So Miguel, come, let's come back to you. Just stop. Okay, sharing. thank you, Adrian. And uh, okay, let me share my screen again. And okay, you should see we're back in workflows. So, and to be honest, Adrian, you did the difficult part of this uh, mm -hmm. on this example because my part is extremely, extremely simple. So, let's do it from beginning. I want to create a new workflow. I I want to leave this one that we did create before running because maybe the there will be contents coming and I don't want to stop those contents to be processed. So I'm going to leave this one running and I am going to add a new workflow. I'm going to call it cleanup. Here we are. And it is a very simple one. It will use a watch folder. <clears throat> it's the place where we want to listen uh, and, and I will transcode it to whatever format, Adrian, that you want me to give you. So what format for you is the best to do the production? What? DPX, for example, that will be fine. Okay, so I will generate DPX sequences out of anything landing in this watch folder. I'm going to connect it here. And uh, I need, obviously, to define the different directories. So I'm going to get uh, this uh, shared slot. And I will say, for example, I will list them from this folder that is called to clean up. So anything landing in this directory will be sent through the workflows. And I will put the outputs in the DPXs directory. There we are. And the last thing to do is to apply the display filter you did. So if I go to the DPX transcoder, I can open the display filters and you will see here that I have the cleanup filter he did create for us. So I am going to select it, add it to the queue. And now, now I have both workflows uh, activated. So anything landing into this folder will automatically transcode it to DPXs, applying all the cleanup VFX stack that you did create automatically. I mean, that's uh, that's really great. And uh, I love the fact that we are we're using, you know, our own sort of technology, you know, in, in a mystical workflows, in, you know, environment, but also using third party software and applications like the DBO tools to actually do those tasks, like Adrian said, you know, and not then uh, tying up the creative suite. Um, but Mystica Ultima customers actually for many years have been exploiting the openness of uh, the system by having the possibility of creating their own uh, scripts. Um, and actual fact, a real differentiator and a gem of Mystica workflows is that it also has the ability to do Python scripting. So Miguel, do you want to uh, show us that in action? Yes, of course. Yes, I will be happy to do it. And to be honest, that is probably one of the parts of the software that I like the most, because I honestly think that is the part that removes completely the limits of the potential of the application. Because if is there anything specifically that you need to do that the application doesn't include, well, if you have an IT department, you can develop your own Python script in order to do it. So that really removes completely 
the the limits. And I am not going to go too much into the detail because I understand that that part is probably a little bit too technical. But I honestly think it makes a, a lot of sense to do a small introduction to the two main aspects of how Python is integrated into the application. So sorry, guys, if this part is a little bit technical, it will not take long. Uh, but I honestly think it's worth to see it for those of you with experience in Python. So pretty much there are two possible ways to use Python into the application. Uh, and for those, uh, you can, I am going to open a new window, uh, which is the um, script editor. The script editor is this window, uh, this window here. And uh, in this window, I will create any um, Python script I want to use. I have a console in which I can write the typical hello, for example. I have a console in which I can I can print anything I want to, and I can run any uh, Python command I want to do. But I am going to focus on this editor that I have uh, here. And in order to show you how it works, I'm going to to bring a small code example to explain you how it works. This is actually a, a node. This is a real node, how it works. How is the way that you will inter integrate a node into the application. It has three sections, three functions. This part here is the construction on which you will de decide the connectors, the input and output connectors you need in your um, node and the parameters you want to add to the properties window. This one is the validation. It, this one defines the color of the dot. It tells the system if it is ready to be processed or if it is, some information is failing or is missing, so it cannot be processed. By default, I'm going to leave it as true, which means the, it is active, it is ready for um, processing. And this section, this last section, the process function, will actually execute the node. In my case, it's a very simple example. It takes the input takes the output and send the input to the output. So it's pretty much a pass-through node to, to put anything in the input to the output. And um, so, the, but as you can see, with 16 lines, I can build my own Python example. So if I want to integrate this node into my system, the only thing I have to do is to right-click into the menu and save it in the library. So if I save it into the library, I can uh, define how I want to call it. So in this case, let me call it, for example, presentation test, because this is a test for this presentation. And you will see how it pops here into the finder. As I save it, there it is. Now I have a new node. I'm going to make this smaller for a moment. Uh, I'm going, now I have a new node, which has an input connector, which is this one, an output connector, which is this one. And in the properties window, it has my parameter with value my value, which is this one I did define here. And I could connect it, connect it here, and then my node would be in the middle of this, uh, of this workflow. I can obviously change the color as well, and I can do uh, anything I want. Uh, so this is how easy it is to integrate any functionality into the application. You could use this to connect to other uh, server, service providers. Uh, for example, the email, actually, the email node that we provide with the system is developed in Python. So you can go to that node and take a look to the code to see how to do this kind of things. But you can integrate anything you want. The other kind of things you can do with Python is not only to be able to create your own nodes, but also to be able to command the whole user interface. So let me create a new script here, and I will show you another example. So let me, uh, this few lines example will help me to, uh, to illustrate how this part works. So first thing I am doing is I am importing a couple of libraries that I need in order to use the different components in workflow. Those are these two lines. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a workflow. I, I am going to, to call it to, uh, today test, for example, and I'm going to create a workflow. So if I execute this code, you will see here how a new workflow is created. Here it is, today test. So at the moment, it's obviously empty because I didn't add anything. But this line here actually adds a workflow of type file to that workflow. So if I execute it, uh, 
this line here. Okay, you can see here I have the um, the file uh, node. If I execute the next line, this one adds a progress uh, a progress node to the workflow. So here it is, and this line here takes the input connector of this uh, the, the input connector of this workflow called video in and connect it to the two connector of the other workflow. So if I execute this line, the two are connected. And I could, for example, get this code and add it to the menu here where I could put my own custom main, made Python scripts and I could create my own behavior scripts or functionality script to drive the application itself and create my own user interface and everything using Python. So both options, both lines are available. You can develop the behavior of the nodes or you can command the user interface, all of it in Python. So I, I honestly think that completely removes the limits on the on this application, Jeff. Yeah, <laughs> to be honest, that's uh, going a little bit beyond what I can do, but I can see if you're a technical person, an engineer, I mean, who knows Python scripting, that's, that's going to be incredibly useful and obviously very, very powerful and has endless possibilities. So actually, Mystical Workflows was initially conceived to solve a huge delivery problem to a major broadcaster in the UK and has already been used in production on a daily basis. Um, the workflow that they actually use actually actually has all uh, and actually much of what we've actually seen in this presentation, including the Python scripting. So do you want to show how, how this works, Miguel? Yeah, sure. Happy to do it. Um, the um, I will. This example is, uh, as you said, uh, is developed for uh, Sony AXN in Spain, in order to help them to deliver content to Sky in UK. And uh, as our audience probably know, Sky is extremely demanding in the in the requirements in order to accept uh, contents because you need to generate what they call an ADI file, which is a huge XML file with a lot of metadata defining all the information with very strict rules about the length limit on the information, the, uh, the supported formats on the input, the languages of the, for the subtitles, etc., etc. So uh, Sony had a team of four people uh, pretty much full time working to generate these kind of deliverables. And uh, Delivering to Sky uh, had a very high rate of failures because it was taking quite a lot of time because many times they had to deliver to send and the content was not passing the validation in the other side. So they had to repeat the delivery, fix the problem, pack again, etc., etc. And that was taking long, 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 long time. So we did de uh, develop a few custom made nodes for them in order to do those deliverables and to automate those deliverables. And I am going to show you that workflow. Before reading it, it will, it, it will also help me to illustrate the reason why this overview window exists. Because as you can see, in this window, we have a kind of a Excel view of all the contents, all the different workflows that I am creating. And uh, so when I have to work with a lot of uh, workflows in parallel, it becomes very handy not to have this node-based view, but to have a spreadsheet view in order to have an, over, an overview of all the workflows I have in one go. So let me open the workflow that they actually use is uh, this one, AXM import. And this is one of the custom made nodes we did, we did for them. This is the workflow they use to deliver contents. It, it actually doesn't look very rocket science. It's very simple. It takes an input file, it's an Excel, Excel file. And on that file, each line has one of the contents they have to deliver it. They generate those files directly from their database, so they export the, to an Excel file all the contents they have to deliver. And then this custom-made node takes those lines and for each one, it creates one specific workflow to, with all the validations and all the checks needed in order to deliver that content successfully to Sky. So if I add it to the render queue and I process this workflow, you will see how here 
And here, new lines, new workflows will start to appear because this node actually is, this is a workflow that actually generate workflows. So this workflow is a workflow generator. So if I execute it, you can see how new workflows are appearing, one line for each uh, content. They are all very similar. So if, if I take a look to the list, you will see they are all very, very similar, but not exactly the same. Why? Because in some cases, there are, for example, contents with uh, one subtitle. There are contents with two subtitles because maybe they are in Spanish or in English. There are contents without subtitles. The number of images going with the content depend on the time on the type of the content. So sometimes it's six, sometimes they are three, because for movies they only have to deliver three images with the movie, but with episodical contents, they need to deliver six, two for the content itself, two for the season, and two for the chapter, so six in total. So uh, they are not the same, but they are pretty similar. I, I will explain you how they work. So for example, let's take a look to this one. It has three different pieces. This part here is the actual media. So I have the movie file, I have six JPEG files that uh, uh, go with the movie to illustrate the uh, Sky Portal, and I have the subtitle files. In this case, it's only one; it could be two, three, or whatever is specified in the Sony AX uh, in the Sony da database. This node here is an information holder. This this node here contains all the information for the that specific content. So if it is season one. Uh, in this case, it is uh, it has the descriptions, uh, the short description, the long description, the season title, the um, the brief description for the season, the short description. So you have all the different uh, all the metadata required in order to generate the content. This node here actually generates the ADI file for uh, for Sky. So it takes all the inputs, and let me move it here so you can see it. It takes all the information from the inputs, the format for the media, the format and resolution for the input images, uh, the subtitle uh, clips, the format for the subtitles, etc. It takes all the information, takes all the information from the database and generate the ADI file that uh, and applies all the validation that Sky applies. So if anything is going to fail, I can select the node and the, the system will tell me what is going to, to fail. In this case, it, it is telling me that the, there is a limitation issue with the season title. It is It cannot be longer than a specific number of bytes. So uh, in this case, it's a warning because the system can fix that one by itself by trimming the content removing words, etc. But there are other potential problems that are not uh, possible to be fixed and they stop the deliverable. So if I take a look to, to, if I want to take a look to the status of my deliverables, I just need to see here the colors of the dots, the thing, the, the files, the, the nodes that are green are ready. If something is orange means that something is missing, I can select it and see what is missing. For, for example, in this case, the file is not in my storage, so I cannot send it because the file is still, is still missing. I could go to the department responsible of that and, and fix the problem. And so when I have all the ADI file, the next thing will be to generate a UBP. The UBP is the actual package I am going to deliver to Sky. If it takes all the media files, plus the ADI file, and it puts all together into one single file, and using Signian, we do deliver the content to, to Sky. So as I said, they all look very similar, and the way they actually work is they, they maximize in one screen this uh, list of contents. You have here uh, a filter, so you can, you can, for example, look for the Einstein content, and it will filter out all the contents related with the, that uh, episodical series. So we are here delivering season three. And uh, for example, if you take a look to this one, this one is completely green, so it can be sent. I could go to that one, add it to the queue, and process it, and that will automatically send the content. And uh, they have been using this for, uh, Sony has been using this for more than a year now. And uh, now, at the beginning, I said they had four people full-time 
delivering this kind of contents. Now they have one person, two hours a day, and he can perfectly manage to deliver all the contents. They haven't had a single failure anymore because the system validates using the same criteria that the Sky uses, validates the content. So if the system allows you to send it, means that it's going to pass the Sky validation. That is an incredible time saver. And in the peak time, when they had to deliver all the contents for AXN now, they had to deliver around 800 contents. And this person did deliver the whole thing in a week. So in one week, they did deliver 800 contents without a single failure. So that can give you an idea about the productivity you can get using this kind of automation, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's seriously impressive. And what looks so simple to start with turned into something so actually quite complex, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, very, uh, well, totally dependable, to be quite honest. I'm guessing if you're an engineer, that should get everyone thinking uh, mm -hmm. about what, what you, know, you can do there. And obviously, you know, one of the things we did uh, for, for this project was offer those um, those bespoke um, SGO development services that we spoke about earlier. I mean, it's quite a, quite a complex thing there. Um, I'm guessing this is probably quite a good time to, to finish the presentation. I mean, we've had a, you know, a really good overview of the system. So thanks, Adrian and uh, Miguel, for taking us through that. Um, and obviously, it's the, it's the launch of the product today. And uh, we're hoping everyone's going to go out there and, uh, and give it a go and let us know what they think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. thank you all for presenting everything. And thank you for joining us at this session. <laughs>